Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. And in this podcast, we interview researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impacts in a socially just and context-specific way. On this episode, I'm very excited to speak with uh, Julia, Julia Steinberger, who is Professor of Societal Challenges of Climate Change at the Université de Lausanne. After earning her PhD on, in MIT on ultra-cold hydrogen, which I tried to have a look on the thesis, but I, I didn't understand much, she came back to uh, Lausanne uh, um, and then Zurich to do some pe- uh, postdoc fellowships before joining the Institute of Social Ecology in Vienna in 2007. In 2011, uh, Julia became Associate Professor of Ecological Economics at the University of Leeds. Um, And uh, since then, uh, I think it was in August uh, of this year, she returned in Lausanne as a full professor. So Julia researches uh, researches on the relationships, or you're going to discuss this uh, with us, on the relationship between um, human needs, uh, but also societal needs and human well-being on the one side, and their associated associated resource and pollution requirements. More notably, you you are a lead author of the IPCC, but also leading the project, which I'm very interested in, uh, living well within limits. So, perhaps before ending uh, the, the introduction, I think it's also fair to say that apart from research, you're also a very seasoned activist on topics from the environmental realm or the societal realm. Um, so as I said, I'm very excited to to chat with you, Julia, and also because I think it's been 10 years I, I wanted to meet with you back in the day in Vienna. Uh, I think it was in 2011 I was there for just a small semester and I was doing my uh, master's thesis on urban metabolism and you were part of the European project SUME or SUM or I don't remember how it was called, but it was right when you left for, for Leeds. So it's a great moment to, to actually meet you and thanks so much, uh, Julia, for being part of the podcast. Thanks for having me. And uh, I, I, now I realize that we're actually almost co-located. The only thing standing between us actually sitting down and having a coffee together is a pandemic. So you know, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's hope the pandemic is soon going to finish. But um, Julia, perhaps, um, first of all, welcome back to, to Switzerland, which seems to be your second home now. Uh, so many back and forth. Uh, I think you also did your, your some school years here back in the day. Um, just uh, perhaps could you introduce yourself briefly how or how do you generally introduce yourself oh, that's always difficult but you did a great job before so i maybe we <laughs> maybe that's enough um in terms of my location i guess i'm swiss but my parents are american but so i was born in geneva but of american parents and that sort of partly explains um moving around uh i guess the other thing is that i'm a physicist by training as you said but i consider myself to be you know, then an industrial ecologist, ecological economist, and now I would say I'm probably also a heterodox economist or even a political economist. So I do have no economics training, no formal economics training at all. Um, but in some cases, it turns out that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not necessarily required to to be able to see that the economy does not work, I guess. Yeah, no, and it's, uh, yeah, so, so I've been moving around a lot, but I think it's also um the sign that this community of industrial ecology i guess which is one of the ways you situate yourself is um a very open one that you know when uh you had a you had one of your episodes with marina fisher kowalski so um but colleagues like siren erkman and claudia binder in switzerland and you know i showed up and they just gave me a chance you know they 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 gave me a chance to do something and i'm i'm ever grateful to to those people because in other fields it's not always like that you can show up and people don't give you a chance. And uh, that is too bad. So explain to me, how did you go from ultra cold atoms to industrial ecology? Um, okay, so the, the thing with, um, I don't recommend this by the way. Uh, I don't recommend what I did. <laughs> so if anybody has a- It choice, turned out well, uh, so I don't think uh, you shouldn't, but. It t- I took the long way around, and um, the thing is, I did. I didn't. I would do. Did my PhD in the knowledge that it was not the thing I was the most excited in. And in fact, in my PhD, I switched. I started out with um, uh, anomalous X-ray pulsars, 
which are like astrophysical objects that are actually really super interesting. But, um, and I couldn't deal with it emotionally. They were too distant. <laughs> so I, after two years, like it was really fun. I discovered some things like it was actually really interesting. Then I, I left that and I went to more concrete stuff. But I knew that the PhD was not my, my passion. And I do not recommend that. I think that before somebody goes and does a PhD, they might want to figure out what they're actually really interested in. However, during the PhD, I discovered something that I was much more passionate about and much more interested in. And the way I discovered that was through a film series, so an activist group, like you mentioned. So I was part of the MIT Social Justice Cooperative. And uh, we, made, we, we made our mission to make life difficult for various um, important people there. And uh, we succeeded. And uh, we, we did all kinds of great things. It was, it was a really great group of people. And, uh, but one of the things we did is we ran this documentary film series and that was something that I, I ran and it was called Whose World Economy? And, um, and basically we were able to, to screen things on globalization, on structural adjustment programs, on the, the links between colonization and resource extraction, on inequality. And it seemed to, that be, taught me very much that that's what I wanted to, to look at in a systemic way. Um, and if you want to look at this interrelation between economic inequality and resource flows and land grabs and all of that stuff, you would better be using a systematic approach, which is what the kind of things that industrial ecology and ecological economics do. So that's what brought me there. Well, it's so I can imagine that uh, because I think it was a uh, even in your PhD thesis, uh, I, when I tried to, to read some uh, introductory bits, you, you already mentioned this uh, activism bits, and I can imagine this was, I guess, what- Oh, you bet, you bet I put that front and center yeah. to my supervisors. <laughs> you bet I did. I, I was that kind of PhD student. Yes. Uh, you, you said that you were doing a, you were giving a hard time to, to the administration of, of the MIT, and I could recognize that. Um, but that was, I guess, also during the, after 2001 uh, moments where I guess, it, well, I guess in activism, th there was something to actually be vocal and, and political about, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that was, um, that, I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a really horrifying time actually. Um, and it was very interesting because we, MIT is a, is a great campus. Um, and one of the things that's great about it is that it's open and it gave a lot of space to students. So you, if you were a student group, which consisted like three people it was a student group. You could get all, you could, you could book auditoriums, you know, in the evening, like any space that wasn't booked, you could book it, you could have events. We would have Chomsky speaking at our events or other people. Um, wow, yeah. And, uh, and we just, that, that time we happened to have a space for a banner to come down from one of the main entrance halls, like the three, you would have these banners that would go down three floors of stairs. So that, and um, so we had a banner that basically said, don't bomb. I, we, it wasn't clear who we were going to bomb back then, so I don't know. I don't know if we listed some countries hypothetically, but we had this banner basically saying that we shouldn't react with 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 you know with a warfare, and um, and we, people were like, you know, we we ended up like I had friends who ended up sleeping next to the banner because people were tearing it down and stuff, and uh, it was a uh, so you know, and people were really aggressive and really. Uh, taking it personally that that was the right thing to do and we had an event we had very quickly like within the, the you know we were just there on the spot so we had an event which was a teach out where we asked a whole bunch of professors that we were friends with to come and speak about this moment and what it meant and and so on and um you know and they were they were happy to do it so we had a whole bunch of these nice professors who were friends with us and they came and spoke at this uh, at this teach out against the war. And at that point, within a week, it was clear that it was going to be Afghanistan. So against the war in okay. Afghanistan, and uh, they were put. Those professors were all instantaneously put on a White House blacklist. Okay. So they were blacklisted by Dick Cheney's wife, as like these like en interior enemies of America, and uh, we were really afraid for them. You know, I mean, like we were like we we didn't realize what we were doing when we asked them to speak, that we were actually putting them at the front of something that could might have been dangerous for them. And uh, so we actually went and apologized. We were like, oh my God, we realized <laughs> that everybody we asked to be to the teach out is on this blacklist and oh my, you know, what's gonna happen now? And they were like, oh no, thank you. Because you were so organized and you organized this event so fast, I'm on this cool blacklist now and all my friends are really like jealous and you know, so, so in the end, it, it all worked out, but, um, but except for Iraq and Afghanistan, which obviously are uh, really suffering still. 
yeah, so that was an interesting um, time. And it was also interesting how, and if maybe it was an, a lesson in how you can be you can be right about, you know, not having weapons of mass destruction. You can be right about the analysis of the problem. Um, you know, we read the Patriot Act. I don't know if you know about American politics, but uh, immediately in the aftermath of 9-11, they passed the Patriot Act, which was this huge anti-democratic piece of legislation. And we actually were staying up late looking at this thing and, and we realized that it was, for instance, it was very anti-environmentalist. It was based, it was the size of a phone book almost. You know, you can download the PDF of it. It was, it was this hundreds of pages. And so it was obviously this thing where they'd stapled in all the anti-democratic, um, oppressive stuff that they'd always wanted, that big business has always wanted, that these corrupt politicians had always wanted. And they'd taken a big old stapler Called the Patriot well, Act. wars are, are good moments to actually, you know, pass these things under the rug and, you know. Uh... And so you had like these huge like prison penalties for, for like attacking an SUV dealership. Like certain industries were protected, like large cars were protected, like GMO crops were protected. You know, it had nothing to do with terrorism, yeah. except okay. that it, it made people who were doing democratic protest terrorists. So that was, yeah, that was an interesting time. Okay. Well, uh, I wasn't expecting that the Patriot Act was also an anti-environmental act, so it was, we get to it learn was, that. Yeah. Yeah, and they, and they started jailing people under it. I mean, that's what the that was the purpose. It was a purpose of you get you 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 name another enemy, and yeah. then you use that big stick to beat up the other enemies that you really fear. And in the U.S., the the the, the um, yeah, the, the, there are certain industries that really fear protest. They really fear. Um, uh, popular um, discontent, uh, including um, uh, the agribusiness and the, the automotive industry and stuff like that. It's quite interesting. I think we're going to get back to this via the, the window or let's say, or from, from yeah. another angle later on, because I'm curious, of course, in this duality between being an activist and being a scientist, being objective and subjective or whatever the terms are later on but i think i want to to enter this later on because there is something that well if i understand well your your whole well your th your your research after uh after physics uh was about this relationship between well-being and well, flows, let's say, uh, flows and yeah. their consequences. Why, why was this the, or was it very soon that you understood that this is like the relationship to, to figure out? So it, it actually goes back even to MIT days. The, there's a story of a graph and it's um, uh, Pasternak, I think was the guy who did it. He made this pretty plot of electricity per capita, so in kilowatt hours versus the human development index that it, as it was measured mm. at the time. And he's got like the different countries of the world, different colors, it's very pretty. And uh, it was shown to us, like I went to this presentation by this guy who was a nuclear scientist at MIT, like from the nuclear industry, but he was a professor on campus. And he was like, this graph shows us that we need more, ener ener um, we need more electricity to get human development. And so this graph shows that we need more nuclear energy. And I was like, actually it shows saturation, dude. So, you know, it showed like there's a little there's part a with symptotic, slope, yeah, for sure, yeah. but then it like you know flattens out real quick, and uh, and he was like, <laughs> you know, for him it was like he'd been reading it that you know he'd been reading it to yeah. justify his story, and I was like, this doesn't stack up. So uh, so did then you, did um, you mention that back in the day? I mean, did you have this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he 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 didn't quite know what to say. He was sort of mm -hmm. looking at it like he hadn't really looked at it before, and of course he didn't have a curve fit or anything like that. Um, but then when I when I started doing research, I came across this this curve again, um, and uh, there's actually who was running this at the time. There's these world it, w it was um, a global energy report, but it was a global energy and development report, and I forget the exact acronym. But there were two or three of them. They were the precursors to the global energy assessment of YASA. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. There was there was a couple of them that came before. And there was somebody who basically showed these two curves at two different points in time and said, look, it's changing. Okay. And I, I only remember his first name, Carlos. He didn't publish, like it was just in this chapter, he didn't publish it. And I was like, but that's really interesting. And then I wanted to show that, to, I was sharing some of those documents with my students and I was like, I wanna understand this better. 
So I remember like staying up like several nights before my lecture, like I need to figure this out. And that became um, uh, one of my first papers because indeed you see this very, very steady change that basically has to do with the fact that life expectancy is making pr steady progress regardless of resource use pretty much. Mm -hmm. And so you see this decoupling. And what I've been doing in my research is I've been looking for decoupling between GDP and energy and material flows and emissions because that would be nice. I mean, I didn't start being a degrowther, but uh, I became- Does someone do, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I was looking, there's like, let, let's look for this green growth, you know? Let's look for this decoupling. And uh, I really convinced myself after a few papers that it was not there. But the interesting thing is because the GDP data comes from these databases where you also have these human development indicators, hmm. I was able to see the decoupling that is happening. And that's with to do with actual like things like human health and education and and things that are not actually that related to GDP at all. And so that's this is what I decided to start studying, be, um, partly because nobody else was doing it. And honestly, at the beginning, it was even hard to um, it was hard to do because everybody was like, "That's cute, but why are you doing it?" Well, at no, least, seriously, that was the yeah. reaction. It was that was honestly the reaction? They're like, "Don't you have a real job?" <laughs> like. <laughs> well, I can imagine also that it depends on the, the crowd and the, the audience uh, doing this. I can imagine that industrial ecologists would say that. Uh, perhaps ecological economists a bit less, or they might be different. I don't know. It's really interesting because all these communities, um, I mean, I remember like I, I submitted an abstract to the first on this base on the basis of this paper, the one that shows decoupling of um, human development and energy use and uh, emissions, I submitted it to the first degrowth conference and it, the abstract got rejected. They were like, no, we don't only care about GDP going down. This other stuff is completely irrelevant. I'm like, okay, so that's changed. That That is no longer the reaction. Yeah. But I also submitted it to the energy, there's a big energy efficiency summer school. Like, I'm going to tell you all about my rejections. I've been rejected a lot. Uh, but Everybody I also submitted has, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 well, this paper got rejected like six times, I think. Oof. Maybe not quite as much over a period of two and a half years. But anyway, so I submitted this abstract to um, uh, the European, whatever it is, uh, there's a th ECEEE on energy efficiency. There's a European uh, summer school and conference on energy efficiency. And I said, no, like, we're not, that's not energy efficiency. <laughs> like, we're looking at efficient light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Insulation. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and now like the first, I mean, um, so I still haven't gone, but now the, the, the first topic of their conference is energy and well-being. So it's like, okay, you just took 10 years to catch up. That's <laughs> fine. I'm not going to be bitter about it. Well, it is hard because, I mean, you you dealt with, let's, even, uh, it's funny, I think uh, Marina was uh, discussing this uh, beforehand and she she also had, I think, this, well-being, um, what, what drives well-being back in the day. And I think she said, well, in the US, it's it's money and the relationship is clear and we should not fund any studies anymore on this. Uh, I think she was working for, was it the OECD at the beginning? Um, and I think that in many, in many fields, there, is, there are either some taboos or some preconceptions, like this equals that, and we do not discuss it anymore until you just turn the rock and you find out, well, if, if we look at it through, you know, that lens or the other lens or the other lens, or there, there is like a, you know, like a disco ball with many small facets around it that it's only when you put them together that it makes sense. Um, and I really liked, um, well, the, the, the paper on the, downscaling the, the planetary boundaries, for instance, which which is mm -hmm. one way to, to look at this as well. Um, and over there, I mean, I think it's many, many studies exist on, let's say, greenhouse gases and GDP or greenhouse gases or material footprint and GDP per countries and having these graphs. Mm -hmm. But now you have several dimensions with several dimensions. And this is where it gets interesting, I think. It's that... Yeah. It's not one versus one, it's all versus all. And how do we manage this equilibrium? And I think it is, was also this the, the rationale be, behind your project, uh, um, the living well within limits or how did yeah, you? 
except that we we actually didn't make it all all dimensions. Um, we we had to sort of uh, narrow it down to make it feasible. So I agree that that is a very interesting an, a very interesting aspect. And maybe just to stay on that before we go into the living well within limits, where we uh, were, where we were more focused. So this was a, a paper that was um, that was led by Dan O'Neill. Um, and he, he, oops, sorry, that was my phone. He and Andrew Fanning made a, um, uh, made the database to a large extent. And uh, then Will Lam and myself helped with also with the analysis and like we each had, anyway. So, um, but the, um, the thing that was, one of the things that was interesting is we basically did this crisscrossing analysis between international um, biophysical boundaries and exceedance, but we looked at the relationships, with, yeah, and and uh, social thresholds. Um, and what was really interesting, one of the things that was super interesting is that there was always one country in each in each of these intertwined, you know, couples. There was always one country that was doing okay. Yeah, it wasn't the same country. Yeah, there was always at least one that had a social threshold and was okay on a planetary boundary. And, and that's one of the ideas that we're taking now um, in the work of a PhD student in the, um, in the Living Well Within Limits project, uh, who's actually co-supervised with Dan as well, is like this idea of a, of a Frankenstein, which is if you understand what are the underlying factors that allow countries to do this, can you then make at least, not in reality, because in reality we know it doesn't exist, but in theory, if we analyze the data, can we make a Frankenstein? Can we make a beautiful, um, creation, like an, an, a, a hypothetical creation of a country that would do things right, could they be okay? And it turns out that they could certainly do a lot better. So that's one of the things that we're, we're actually making progress on. And um, I've learned to take it as a good sign when there's a certain amount of resistance against a paper. So the reason this paper <laughs> has not been published yet is because it's encountering a certain amount of resistance, which good. I think makes it probably really good. So <laughs> Great. We're get there. Um, which is funny because I don't remember in which paper it was. It was one of the papers where you said that actually the word is more unjust as a whole than per country. Uh, and so yep. I was wondering, therefore, you know, if you made your Frank Frankenstein baby, will, would that be better or worse if, if we try to, to make it at a global scale? Or, you know, does, that, does such thing exist, of course, if, if we can make it at a global scale or not? Yeah. It's actually really interesting because I think both had it, it, it will these things these patterns that we're looking for are international anyway. So in in and in fact, if we see anything, it's sort of working at a global scale, or at least within the international data. So that that's one thing. So that, that that's um, the other thing is we can we can do this modeling. Um, so we modeled uh, a bottom up model of energy demand for uh, decent decent living yeah. standards. And that turns out to look just fine. Actually, it looks great. Uh, it looks it looks a lot lower than what we're using now. And the other thing is when we look within countries, which is um, the work of the PhD of Marta Baltrushevitz, uh, she's um, she's looking within countries and looking at well-being outcomes versus you know really granular household data energy footprints, and she's finding that well-being outcomes are often achieved at lower energy use than average. Um, even in quite poor countries with quite low levels of energy use on average. So that's, that's really super interesting as well. Uh, so, so I would say that the, the, I think the odds are that there's, um, you never want to promise something that you haven't checked completely, yeah. but I would say that the <laughs> odds are that there's a, that, that there, that there are patterns of doing things right that we can learn from. Yeah, because I, I think there was a fantastic, uh, well, unfortunately I have to admit that, uh, in the. In this uh, in this paper on the living, uh, sorry, I always forget the title, but good life within planetary. Boundaries. Yeah, exactly, a good life with uh, for all uh, within planetary boundaries. I saw that Greece was the worst country because it it transgressed all of the biophysical uh, boundaries for the least amount of uh, social boundaries. So I was like, okay, that's some. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I'll have a look at the at the data. It was funny to see that. I don't think that's, is that true? So it seems, so if you go to the column of all of the transgressed biophysical boundaries, so the worst uh, in the environmental realm, and then you look at which one has the least amount of social thresholds achieved, 
then you arrive to yeah. the but there are countries that are well below Greece in terms of social outcomes as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that are, yeah. I mean, you know, I it's mean, not. That means nothing, of course. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. But uh, it's funny. I think that everybody is interested when you look at comparisons because you, you try to see yourself, you try to understand what, what happens there. Um, and I had one question before we move on to, to the living uh well within limits, which was, so you had this very interesting graph in this paper as well, which was, you said, what is the minimum resource use? Uh, no, yeah, the minimum uh, resource use for, for the planetary boundaries or for the CO2 emissions and all of that, based on this, the achieving, uh, satisfying the, the social needs. And for most of them, it's, you know, you could go below the planetary boundary, except mm -hmm. one, which was democratic quality. And that's always went up. Is there a reason for that, a particular reason, do you think? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, that, that's one of the that's one of the issues with this kind of work is that if you, if you see these relationships, you don't always know what's lying under them. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, for yeah. democratic quality, you have to think about what's what's hiding behind that indicator. So you have to see how that indicator is measured. I mean, we only chose indicators, like I'm not gonna remember each one of them now. No, yeah, we only course. chose indicators that um, uh, we thought were good and actually measured something. But in some cases they'll be measuring, depending on how it's measured exactly, it might be reflecting some things or another. And the other thing is you also have things that are an accident of history. Yeah. Like there might be an accident of history that says that all the countries with democratic quality happen to be post-colonial Western powers and that everybody else by definition has lower democratic quality. And then you're starting to see the fact that you're, you're talking in terms of the world system about the extractive core that is extremely resource intensive because we are the core. We take all the resources to us. That's what we do. Uh, you know, so, so it might be that kind of thing that's going on. Yeah, 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 yeah of course, I mean. As a guess. Um, the other one that was interesting to me was we, we had to choose which education indicator to choose mm -hmm. and um, uh, I will, you know, which level like tertiary or secondary and Dan was like, let's go for tertiary because that's a more, you know, that's like better than secondary. Secondary is a low bar. And it turned out that ter tertiary education, achieving tertiary education was also associated with quite high resource use on average. Mm. And um, and it's not because but it's not because universities are resources. <laughs> well, perhaps you know scientists fly a lot or used to fly a lot. So, but yeah, that's that's <laughs> not going to make enough of a difference, sadly. But I think, but you, but it might have. To, I would say that it probably has to do more with the industrial structure of a country where tertiary education is dominant. Yeah, like because you know, it, it doesn't is, extract anymore. Yeah, is it? or 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 that people are then employed as engineers or they're employed as this or that. Like, it's like, by the time your economy is depending on people with tertiary education, yeah. you're, you're gonna be doing things differently in terms of that. So that was, um, yeah. So it's not a direct thing. Yeah, you're yeah. sort of looking at a, at a historical association. Okay, let's talk about uh, your, your project, the, the living well within limits. So what was the, the rationale behind it? Of course, I can imagine if you look at the, the relationship between uh, living well, uh, well, human well-being and then uh, the resource use, I can imagine that you try to find a balance between the two and can we achieve both? What, what, was that uh, something you, you had in mind? Yes, I, I really wanted to pursue further this, um, what I basically uncovered, which is this, um, this decoupling of human development indicators uh, that are linked to well-being, uh, you know, and and uh, and resource use, and I thought that it was something that was understudied. There, were, there's very few other people studying it. Um, the the main groups are uh, were at the time uh, Tom Dietz, Jean Rosa, who sadly passed away, and I miss him a lot, um, and um, Richard York, and Andrew Jorgensen, also in the U.S., and uh, and Timmons Roberts, who's also my colleague. So that was sort of like a few people in the US. There was Narasimha Rao who got an ERC grant on decent living energy and we collaborate with him. He's at Yale now. And um, um, that's it. And then us, that's it. So very, very few people looking at this. And 
So I wanted to be able to pursue it further and really look in um, across scales and across time. So I wanted to be able to look for associations within countries, to compare countries, to look at trends over time, and to look at trends across countries. And I wanted to be able to look at inequality as well. Uh, I wanted to have an aspect of it that was where we actually go and talk to communities uh, that's run into a bit of trouble with COVID, as you can imagine, but we've done some of that. And um, also to look at the political economy. And that's something where it turned out the project actually did a lot more than I almost expected, which is to look at, um, when you look at the political economy, the question is, if it's possible, I mean, and that, that was kind of the thing, like the question that, that confused me when I, people first asked it, they were saying, well, if, you know, because one of the things we did in the, in the first paper on human development and energy use is we showed these curves that like you can achieve universal human development at the level of energy we're using now or lower. And then people are like, okay, well, that's it then. And we're going to reduce our energy use because of that. Like as though the world economy is trying to maximize human development. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. That's, that's just the <laughs> sweet, sweet illusion that is. That is not true. And I was like, no, that's not how it works. And um. And so, so I think it, it, it became very important in the, in the Living Well Within Limits project to explain why we're not living well, not within limits. So to basically try to understand the mechanism, you know, if it's possible, then why the heck aren't we doing it? What's standing in the way? And the thing that's standing in the way is um, our, our economic systems, right? That are based on profit, that are based on uh, what, um, uh, Jason Moore calls the the four cheaps, right? Cheap resources, labor, land, uh, and energy. So that that kind of thing. Um, so so yeah. So we wanted to study that, and that's been very interesting. So the um, we've looked at car dependency. We've looked at privatization. Um, Miklos Antal uh, led a fantastic paper, which I really adore. On um, uh, he wrote it with uh, Image and Rattle and Giulio Mattioli on um, unsustainable transitions. Like everybody's studying, trying to study sustainable transitions, which are not happening in reality. Like we need to study reality, which is where unsustainable transitions are happening. So, uh, you know, trying to understand what lies behind the fact that our cars are just getting worse over time and that's driving emissions in the Western world. Like it's SUVs, it's not because we, and we don't need them, nobody wants them. Well, yeah. It doesn't add want, but uh, because a of human the ads, need, but, yeah. but you know, but so, so nobody's studying the unsustainable transition. So we were able to like at least write a paper saying, "You guys are really missing the story," you know. So so that was um, yeah. So that that, that was a for me that was a very important part of the project. Yeah. And within the project, also you, I think you start exploring. Well, of course, what. So I can imagine, you know, that there, there are things such as sufficiency, what is the right amount? I think it was in, in your other paper where you discussed about what, what would be the, if we consider the, the minimum amount of energy we would need, we would go back to levels of 1960s or something like that. So it, it is possible. It's not that our yeah. needs could be met, right? So, and then you said what is keeping us from it is perhaps the, the economic system. You also have in another paper on the discourses of climate delay, why people are not changing. Um, and I'm wondering, in your opinion, what, what will, is there something that you see as a, a tiny sliver of hope that this is what, what changes already? Something that you really see that goes fast and does change amongst all of these, uh, well, not very, uh, helpful or hopeful uh, circumstances that we're living in. I don't. I don't have a lot. Uh, I'm actually in a. In you know. Well, I mean, we're little. We're little human creatures faced with a, a huge, a huge cataclysm that's coming our way. So I don't. I don't generally feel hopeful. But sometimes, <laughs> I, you know, we have little ups and downs that don't necessarily um, relate to the reality of things. But I think. In the reality of things, we're being um, the people who have the information on how systematically bad things are and how much geared they are against us. Like these discourses of delay, they're not random. They're, they're systematic. They've got a logic to them and they are always trotted out. And people fall for it, you know? And that's one of the things that we see, you know, in the in the in the UK uh, and around the world, you have constantly on television sets, on radio programs 
you know, people who are basically apologists for the industry going on and saying, oh, we just found this cute new technology for clean plane fuel, don't worry. And of course, if you're just Joe Schmo and you don't realize that they're absolutely full of it and that they're just saying this with the express purpose of putting people back to sleep and that none of these technologies have a chance in heck of doing anything anytime soon, you know, that puts you back to sleep. That's like, all people want to hear is don't worry. You do not have to worry about this. Like nobody wants to hear the message of you have to keep worrying about this. It's so much worse than you think. The people you think are there to help you are not helping you. The people you think are there to inform you are hiding stuff. Like nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to, yeah. nobody wants to get that, that distressed, you know? So people just love to hear those messages. They're like soothing lullabies and you go back to sleep. And, um, and that's what's out there. And we're not, the message is not getting through how much trouble we're in and the message is not getting through that we can still change it. I mean, even when the communication is given, oh, things are quite bad, it's very often in the context of, well, that was it for humanity or, you know, like, or there's just this sense of inevitability, you know, like we're doomed yeah. and, you know, so that's not actually technically true. Um, yeah, that's the surrender and, part, let's say. Yeah, yeah, this is surrender part, you know, but so people go from the not hearing about it to the like, okay, you can hear about it, but you can still forget about it. And nobody actually does, does the grown up thing of sitting down and being like, we have a real problem and we have yeah. real work to do. Like that is completely missing from, from the world around us. And uh, that does not make me hopeful or happy. I think it's, I think just, there's just a real, um, shortfall in communication and in in the the real communication that people need to hear and so we're just i don't know i don't know how to um, i don't know how to change that i think scientists we have a real problem because we're taught not you know we're taught not to take part in these debates in some ways so mainstream economists didn't get the memo the, the mainstream economists and the people who are working on like cosmetic techno fixes that won't actually work they did not get the memo that they're not supposed to go on tv and spout bullshit the rest of us did so, so, so I think that that's a real problem. Um, and, uh, and behind that problem is um, a, lot of, a lot of bad things are gonna be, are happening now and are, are going to get worse. So. But you are a physicist, you should be excited about technofixes, no? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no. I am. No, it's true, it's actually true. I'm excited about technofixes. Techno I'm extremely excited about housing retrofit. Okay, it's is bit, that, it's, is that it's a really a bit, sexy one? It's a bit less sexy than the sequestration of CO2 or ter terraforming Mars and all of that. So yeah, I would, uh, you know. But that's the thing is like, we act, no, the, the technology is there. <laughs> it's just, it so happens that it's technology that nobody can, um, you know, that, that, that people can't get themselves to dream about. But honestly, these things are the dream because they're these, those technologies around efficiency and sufficiency are the ones that allow you to live well and not destroy the planet. Like, you know. That's and they're there, right? I mean, uh, it, it's funny because in the, in your <laughs> in the other paper on, on the warning of um, um, scientists warning on affluence. Um, so w when I re read this paper before reading this paper, I thought it was just going to be on a, the iPad formula. So impact equals population times affluence times technology. And in general, we talk about technology and population. Like th there is you know, the Mal Malthusians that are saying population is what's driving everything. And then there is the techno techno people that would say, well, technology is going to help us um, get away from, uh, from the trouble we're within. And I thought this paper is just going to, you know, take the last bit of the equation and talk about uh, affluence. Well, it was a bit <laughs> wrong because the it went much further than the formula and it went, uh, well, it got very real, very fast, talking about radical approaches, eco-anarchism, eco-socialism, deconstructing capitalism. So it was, uh, I wasn't expecting that when reading the, the paper and I, uh, you, you learned me some, uh, some expressions such as eco-anarchism. I had never heard uh, that before. Um, so how did you, I, I think you had fun while writing this paper with uh, your co-authors. Uh, could you perhaps describe a bit these meta approaches 
uh, about radical approaches, but also reformist approaches. Uh, and of course, the green growth uh, approach. Like, what what are they? Well, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna point you to your your next uh, your next guest if you haven't great. had them yet. I don't know who who all you've had, but um, I'm the last author on that paper. So yes, I did have fun with it, but also I was I was invited along for the ride. I did not write most of it. I thought it was I you know that you're the last author when you do the least work. So that was definitely <laughs> me on that paper. Um, I, I did do some things. I mean, I did, I did deserve to be there. But um, I have to say that, uh, you know, the people who really started it, so Tommy Viedman and, and Manfred Lenson, who are obviously giants in uh, the field of input-output analysis, um, both of them absolutely fantastic scientists who I adore. And they, uh, so they were really collecting this whole body of empirical evidence around inequality and who was using what and, uh, and, and showing, you know, that actually the richest people across the world and within countries have this hot, really outsized impact. So that was sort of the basis of it, which wasn't, you know, it goes, it, that goes beyond IPAT. It's really because you're looking at the distribution yeah. um, as well. But then uh, Lorenz Kaiser, who is a student at Leeds, um, uh, and I think he's a genius. Uh, he was doing his bachelor's. Um, I didn't even realize that. Anyway, he, he happened to be down in Australia working with them and he's Lorenz, so he went by boat. Ah, and that's the Lawrence. Okay, I know the story. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that is the Lawrence. <laughs> okay, this Lawrence. He, he he is he is a man of uh, of principle and uh, and uh, and sheer will. And, yes, uh, indeed. <laughs> yep, got lots of and also uh, and so he was like, you know what, you know what, that there's something missing here. We need to talk about these other these other aspects of affluence, and it goes further than that. And so that he was actually uh, he was the one who had the idea of inviting of inviting me along because he he known me in Leeds. And he was like, you know what? We so let's 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 put these other pieces on. So I brought the sort of um, affluent classes have to do with capitalism, have to do with ownership, have to do with uh, you know have an interest in this profit accumulation. So making the link to Thomas Piketty's work on the fact that we actually have two different economies, well at least two different economies going at the same time, one for everybody else and the one that actually is accumulating, um, and that that has to do with the with with affluence. And, uh, and Lorenz Kaiser is the one who brought this, this beautiful table on eco-anarchism and eco-socialism and the, the more green growth reformist approaches. And, um, and so, yeah, you should, you, first, you should, I think you should talk to him because he's great. He reads everything and he knows everything. So he's, he's fantastic. Um, and he's in Zurich, so we could actually have a meetup of the whole- Ah, nice. Um, he, he came area, back and Yeah, area research people it would be great fun. Um, but so, I think that that became quite important to include in there to really make it clear what these, how the different approaches view the problem and what kind of solutions are proposed. And because if you have this sort of more, more systemic political economy, you know, Marxian political economy approach of saying, who is benefiting from the system, who is driving the system, um, you know, not because they want to, but because that's what the econ, you know, that's what a capitalist economy creates is it creates a class of people that are very interested in keeping the capitalist economy going. And it doesn't, it doesn't hold on one of them. If you can't convince Elon Musk, you know, um, to stop being Elon Musk, then somebody else will probably become Elon Musk again. So it, it so you have to understand it as a system. And if you do, you do you realize that reformist approaches are not going to work, basically. Like if you have that analysis of the system as um, as driven by capitalist dynamics you will not be a reformist anymore. That's, I think, the conclusion. Well, it's it's funny because I, when I talked about uh, this with uh, with uh, Yorgos Kallis on on degrowth and how he arrived from also environmental engineering, let's say, to to then degrowth later on with a, a small, um, you know, uh, going from the roundabout of political ecology, let's say, um, I kind of said, okay. Would any engineer doing your pathway should should arrive to the same conclusions as you arrive to degrowth? And you know, you talk about Elon Musk. He he's a physicist, I think, right? So I think so. Uh, well, anyhow, or or an engineer. Well, well, uh, you know, a technical person, let's say. But how come he is so well thinking about systems, but not seeing that system? So I think. In a way, in his uh, 
in the book, uh, the, the case for degrowth, one of his co-author mentioned the common sense, and it's actually not one common sense, but many common senses, and they, they coexist simultaneously. Uh, and so that is a bit what I'm, what I don't know how to deal with. How do we deal with uh, convincing, uh, changing common senses uh, into one common sense? Is that even possible? Because, well, on our mind, I mean, it's it's obvious. The, the the solutions are obvious, let's say. But how do you do you convince the people who are not yet convinced? Or what what is the is it with one graph that you will sh that you'll show them, and that will be that? Okay, I lost. Sorry, you won. I <laughs> I'm convinced now. Or how how would you have you seen any convincing uh, elements over the years? Well, it's it's quite interesting because uh, one of the things we're trying to do, and I um, so myself and two colleagues, Elke Pergmeier and, and William Lam, we're trying to write this book, and we've been trying for like a year and a half now, which we just we just need to. Do, do it but um and but that's one of the things it's about it's about the different stories we tell ourselves and why ideas matter and if as a physicist if you told me like ideas matter and ideas can change the world i would have laughed at you because um because i just didn't see things that way i was just like there's reality and you throw things at reality and you understand reality and that's what there is but actually how you choose to see reality matters because we're actually very good as human beings, we're actually very good at telling us stories. We, the way we make sense of things is we simplify things through stories. And through those stories, either we see parts of reality that agree with them, or we just we're capable of ignoring or explaining other things that don't quite fit in very weird ways. And one of the things that we're thinking about in this, in this book is we're basically saying, okay, what are the alternative stories we can tell people to open their eyes in such a way that they're capable of decoding reality differently, that we give them the tools to see what we believe to be a better explanation of reality than what they have. And it, and it comes down to, a lot of it comes down to, um, I don't know if you've read uh, Less Is More by Jason Hickel, but it comes Less down, it, you know, yeah. part of it, yeah, that, um, that he, he explains this history, you know, that we come from a history of inequality, a history of appropriation and colonization, but to us it's presented as a history of progress. Hmm. Whereas, you know, um, and if you look at the economy, we're, we're, we're taught that the economy is market and it's the rules. And if you follow the rules and everybody is selfish in the market, then we get social welfare, you know, that we get good things for all of us if everybody is self selfish in the market. And it's like, none of, none of that actually remotely makes any kind of sense. But, but that's the story. And then it gives us reasons to, ex to excuse why there's poor people. The poor people are not deserving in various ways. It gives us reasons as to why there's rich people. You know, so we, we have this sort of mythology that uh, excuses the crimes we see around us and tells us that they're not crimes when they are. And, and, uh, and so that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to do. So I think it's, it's less about a graph. And, you know, especially the graph is hilarious because um, that was one of the things I learned coming from physics where I was like, look at this beautiful graph. And then you have, <laughs> not, not to be insulting, but like really intelligent people in different fields and social sciences or whatever, who just are like, I don't know what that shows. And I'm like, <laughs> you know? But you see, don't you see it? <laughs> you see, you see it. Y axis, <laughs> X axis, that's it. It's, I've never seen anything so clear in my life. And they're just like, no, -uh. you need to tell me what I'm looking at. And, you know, so, so there's, there's an element of that is we need to tell people what they're looking at, but not, not in, a, in an infantilizing way. And if I had to think about what has helped me um, make more sense of things, I think that a book like Jason Hickel's is really good, for instance, he goes through a lot of the scholarship in terms of explaining the, the economic history and reality of where things are coming from. Um, I think other other things that have been really important for me are things um, uh, like uh, Ngugi Wationgo, who's a, who's a Kenyan writer uh, who wrote um, Decolonizing the Mind, which is, a, which is an excellent book talking about different ways of, of knowing things and, and the importance of colonial modes of thought in, con in, in controlling the way people do things. So that you have different, there's sort of like this patchwork of different thinkers uh, obviously, I mean, you know, obviously the people within eco into, uh, ecological economics, like 
Tim Jackson and Kate Rayworth are, are and Jorgos Callas. I mean, they're every all of these people are really important. I think if somebody reads Prosperity Without Growth or somebody reads Donut Economics, they they don't come out of it looking at the world the same way. Yeah. But I'm I'm afraid that there's not just I wish there was one thing in some ways, but in in another way, we just we just have this this struggle. What's I think one of the things that's positive is that I think younger people are much less likely to believe the fairy tale stories because they're not really living a fairy tale anymore. Like I think it's you know my generation, people could still be like, it's working for me, so it's the fairy tale is true. But I think anybody who who basically came of age after two thousand eight. That wasn't really possible anymore because there was this financial crisis which was a crime you know just because it's an economic <laughs> crime it's still a crime like it was bad things happened to real people you know like and of course the, the ones responsible did not go to jail as as per always but yeah yeah and i mean if if, if you're from greece yeah yeah you know that that's a real crime i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and after all, they, they now have admitted, I, think, I don't know if it was the, the Central European Bank or the IMF that said, oh, austerity doesn't really work. Well, thanks. I mean, people just, uh, suicide, <laughs> you know, there, I don't know how many people committed suicide and how many families were ruined over 10 years, but now we agree that perhaps it wasn't a good idea. Great. And the UK did it to itself. You know that Greece is part of the, re like part of the big reason for Brexit? I don't okay. know if you know that. No. Because the UK imposed austerity on its own um, in 2011, right when I came. I came right at the at the end of reasonable life in the UK, basically. And life expectancy, by the way, was going normally in normal life. Every year, you, life expectancy goes up by three months and a half. Okay. Shoot. I know. Um, so life expectancy just keeps trekking up. In the UK, it's gone like this. Mm -mm. It's like flatlining are going slightly down now okay. since austerity in 2011 it just went like because they cut all the social services and social services are what keep us alive anyway so the uk goes through austerity like already five years of it and then they vote for brexit and then it turns out that that was one of the things they thought they thought that austerity so somehow the tories who imposed austerity managed to convince their voters that austerity was the fault of the eu like in greece so they yeah, just beautiful. I mean, it's uh... <laughs> anyway, yeah, but uh, but that's actually one of the things that's interesting in terms of what we see in the Living Well Within Limits project is these underlying conditions that allow people to live well with less have to do with good public services. They don't necessarily have to do with economic flows or energy flows or material flows or anything like that. They have to do with um, uh, the efficient exist the existence of efficient accessible, affordable networks of public services around transport, around electricity, around sanitation and water, healthcare, education, like the, it's that The ones stuff. you call the, the provisioning uh, yeah. systems, right? And you, you, you get that stuff and then it's okay. People people can be okay if you if you give that stuff people can be okay. But, but I think this is very powerful messages and I, I really like your recent papers because they quantify some of these yeah. uh, elements and they're very reassuring as well even if things do not go you know in the right direction at least we know that it's possible you know I always had the fear that it's we're you know it's it's done we're we're, we're done it, it is yeah. well it might yeah no I think I think I think it is entirely possible to do things completely differently yeah and, and still be I mean people, yeah and people will be fine because the fact is what people need is they need protection. Like you need enough, you need sufficiency and you need protection, you need safety, you need stability. You know, you need to know that if you get sick, somebody's gonna take care of you. You, need, you know, you, you have this sort of basic safety net like, and, uh, and, and that, that safety net exists in your physical environment as well. You know, I need to know that if I break my leg, there's a bus that's not too far where I can go with my crutches. Um, this is very real to me because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on my third knee operation of the last Oof. year. So, so, so I, I know about the importance of good public transportation because I haven't been able to get on my bike as much. Let's just put it that way. Um, but and the healthcare you know, so, system as well, but yeah. Yeah, and the healthcare system and like, you know, the, the, so, so, so all of these things are just, are just super important because the fact is that life is full of accidents. Like a normal human life is full of accidents. It's full of little, um, you know, the, the, this idea that, I don't know if you've read Anne Rand books, probably not. 
Doesn't that's, ring that's, a bell. that's a poisonous idea. So Atlas, she basically is the is the um, romantic novelist of neoliberalism. Okay. She's horrible. Uh, <laughs> she, she influenced uh, like uh, the 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 U.S. Federal Reserve. There's this whole bunch of people in the U.S., but also in Europe, who really love her stuff, and like it's really mind poison for teenage boys, to be honest. But she wrote so Atlas Shrugged or um, The Fountainhood or whatever. She has this this, this ideal of the self sufficient entrepreneurial individual who hates altruism because it's a sign of weakness and um and it's like and it's this that is not real life real life is something where you from time to time you're able to do stuff and from time to time you need some help and and so we really need to be in this web of protection and the problem is if that web of protection is gone people fall through the cracks really fast and you see that show up in the data you see it show up in life expectancy going down you see it show up in, in, in basically things falling apart. And, uh, and, that, and that's what we have to do is we have that, especially given the fact that we're coming into the century of crises, you know, uh, that, that, that mutual protection has to be the, the, the real focus of what we do. Well, and we're not going to have sufficient resources if we continue like that. So there's going to be without cooperation, just people are, are going to die. So it's, I mean, it's, it's very real. Okay, I want to ask you, before asking you the last questions uh, that we usually ask, I want to ask you a main question, which is, well, this podcast focuses on cities. And you worked back in the day on this sustainable urban metabolism project, which was actually, I think, the first European project working on urban metabolism. Um, and I think it was in 2010 with uh, Helga Weiss, you, you also wrote a paper on reducing uh, energy and material flows within cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but back in the day, you, you discussed about, you know, the, the urban form that has an impact on uh, transportation energy. You discussed about life cycle energy uh, and materials of buildings. You also discussed about reducing household consumption. You know, now, 10, uh, 10 years later, with all of your experience, if now that you have moved, let's say, and uh, you, you recently saw, I think, also the, the climate plan of Lausanne. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to design such a plan, for instance, what, what would be your your strong points to put forward? Especially that it's a city, right? So it's a, in the middle of a, I guess, a consumption node rather than anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think that I think that the the things are not. Um... Oh, I'm going to spill some beans. Um, so the, the things are not nothing. None of this is rocket science. And so one of the things that's great here is we're in the region where Sura and Erkman started doing industrial ecology. So people started caring about material flows. And he did one of the first reports on Geneva was part of his team. They did an industrial metabolism of Geneva. And then I came along and I did some more things on Geneva. That was sort of how I got into it. And um, they were not allowed to publish their main finding on what they what okay. could be done. Nice. The city of Geneva was like, uh uh. Um, and it was stop eating meat. The first thing that anybody in it, like the, the first most impactful action that people in the city can do is actually change their diets. And that was not allowed to be said because Swiss agriculture is um, for animals. So we grow, we grow crops, but we grow them for fodder. Uh, so, so that was just not allowed to say, but I think the main, the main domains stay the main domains. Um, it's, it's always transport, housing and, uh, and food, and then you have consumables and, and food, you know, let's, let's grow food for ourselves. Let's not go through these more inefficient organisms, despite the fact that they're cute. So, you know, massively reducing meat and dairy consumption that needs to happen. I mean, um, you know, and, and, and it's a real shock, by, by the way, coming from the UK, where there's a huge amount, like, you can go to restaurants, and there's like, just huge amounts of vegan food all over the place. And it's really good. And here, there's nothing. Yeah. And it's pathetic. And well, there's and, also uh, Indian uh, cuisine, I can imagine in the UK that has a delicious. Yeah. Well, yeah, except potatoes and cheese, I don't know what the <laughs> No, well, here, no, well, but the thing is, we have lentils, we grow lentils, we grow soy, we grow all these, all these great things that we can eat. I mean, there's no, it's, that's not the problem. It's the problem is that people aren't, anyway, anyway, but the point is the food can change and should change. So that's one thing. 
uh, on trans, you know, I mean, it, then none of these are magical. On, on housing, we need to do massive area-based retrofit. We can't do retrofit one building at a time. We need to do it one street at a time, one neighborhood at a time, where you just, you just do it like a machine. And that needs to be, because that's when you get sc scale and cost to come down. That's when it makes sense to do it in a city. It has to be publicly funded and subsidized. Uh, you're gonna have to do cost recovery another way than getting it through renters. You know, maybe, yeah, the, 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 you, you just have to think of another way because otherwise people are not gonna accept it, but that needs to happen. So area-based retrofit, uh, so diet change, area-based retrofit, and then the other thing is you need to get the cars out. So, you know, you keep, you keep uh, electromobility um, in it for, for public transportation and for people who need it for their work or who need it because they're disabled or, or old or whatever. And then everybody else, sorry, no car. And that will be fine because you can get like all these other ways of getting around now, which, which are really fun and safe and healthy as long as there's not too many other cars around. So that's the, that's the key thing. You know, th then you, you, you get this effect of scale where like once it's safe and everybody's doing it, everybody's doing it and thinks it's normal. Um, that doesn't solve the problem of mobility outside of cities, which is generally worse anyway, but. And I can imagine the last one, which is consumption, which is of course the indirect things that happen because of cities. Yeah, the, the consumption bit is because people are richer in cities generally, right? So yeah. because people have more disposable income and then they're, they're, they're sort of buying more. And, um, and I think that that's also something where we have to, you know, the, the move to a post-consumer society is an economy-wide issue. And the fact that wealthier people tend to spend money on, on, on useless, wasteful stuff is also something that it's a culture that we have to change a bit. And I'm hoping that maybe the pandemic has helped a little bit with that, although maybe Maybe I'm completely wrong and people want to go out and shopping sprees afterwards. But like, you know, um, I just want to get a coffee or, you know, a glass of wine or a glass of beer. That would be yeah, already or, fine. And I think one of the things that I don't know if you've had Marlene Sahakian on your show yet. Not yet. But yeah, she's great. So but she's done this 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 great experiment where they basically brought people kits. It was a challenge. It wasn't like you're bad people stop consuming. It was like. This is, it's like Veganuary. I don't know if you've ever done Veganuary. Just for a month, try being a vegan just for a month. And uh, so they did this challenge, like wear the gene for the 30 days challenge without washing it or uh, turn your thermostat down challenge. And they gave them like sweaters and like, like they made it like this fun sort of game thing. And they had a lot more success because they were giving people a goal yeah. and it was playful and they had the tools to troubleshoot it. They had different strategies to think about it. So that was very important as well. So if you want people to consume less, one of the things you can do is you can actually like help them with that kind of sort of very um, specific approach that helps them make sense of their life in a different way. And I think that that's, uh, that's really a great, the great, a great marriage of sociology and industrial ecology uh, that Marlene's done there. So I'm really, really, I think that's really great research. Okay, before, you go to small questions that we generally ask what's well you already mentioned some of the uh, of the bits but what do you you want to work on on 2021 what is your kind of your exciting small thing that you're working on except the, the book you mentioned oh god I, I i i said yes to things um so there's several there's a couple of papers on energy sufficiency which i'm really excited about because it turns out we wanted there's a bunch of us who are in the ipcc who wanted to get energy sufficiency in there. And I probably shouldn't be saying this, but I don't, I'm sort of past caring, but um, because we're not supposed to divulge internal discussions, but basically we couldn't do it because it turns out there's not a single definition of sufficiency and it's not in the literature enough. So basically we have to write these two papers on sufficiency and, um, and then maybe people will know what we're talking about. So that, that's, that's one thing. So we're, we, we've got that. Um, there's another, I actually want to do some quantitative analysis, but I'm not going to talk about that, but it's basically just building on, 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 on new and, and better data and more, more indicators. And that's, I think that's fun. At and, what scale? Um, I'm sorry? At what scale? Oh, uh, internet, internationally, but it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, ask me about it in six months and then I'll tell you. But, um, and there's another uh, another paper that's really important, which is um, we're going to try to bring together all the findings of the Living Well Within Limits project into one paper. Ah. Uh, because uh, I've, I have been asked several times, what is the one paper I should cite about your project? And I'm like, 
well, there are so many and you should read all of them and you should care about all of them. People are like, no. Oh, one. <laughs> just, the, just the one. So we're going to try to write the one uh, with, all our, with all our findings. And um, uh, so that, that, that's really exciting as well. And the last question. So you, I generally ask what books, articles, or videos would you recommend us to, to read or to, to go through? So you mentioned Less is More from Jason Hickel. You mentioned yeah. Decolonizing the Mind. Anything yeah. else? Um, yes, I think that uh, one of the things I've been doing during the pandemic is my, my, my hobby is sewing. So I sew masks and whatever. If people, um, so I've been doing more listening to lectures than reading books. But I really recommend David Harvey's series on capital, reading capital. So if you have the time to spend an hour with a really nice man saying really interesting, intelligent things, you know, for a few evenings, you, you will not regret it. Um, I think that's really important. And uh, uh, David Graeber also has some great, um, uh, sadly, uh, died last year. So there's some really great videos of him explaining his work and explaining his book debt and so on. And I think that those are so great because they both, um, well, David Graeber especially has this, this idea of imagination, you know, that we really need to do that. This, the world is something that we can, that we can, that we can create anew, that we can change. You know, he's really the last thing than deterministic. He says, it's up to us humans. So this is a human creation. We can, we can think about this completely differently. And I think that that's, um, that's a really wonderful gift to have because so much of our, of our science and knowledge is like, this is the trend. And he's like, Eh, who cares about that? Let's think about it differently, you know, which is, which is lovely. And he's also, I mean, all of these people, they're just, it's nice to see the human behind the book or the human behind the thinking, just to see these really intelligent, warm, interested people. That's really nice as well. Thanks so much again, Julia, for taking all of your time uh, this evening. Thanks everyone as well to listening until the end. And uh, yeah, I hope we're going to meet soon uh, to discuss all uh all over this uh, over coffee or something like that definitely thanks so much and um yeah talk to you soon <laughs>